All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our talk uh, on inclusive immersion, inclusive design of immersive content. Um, we have some fantastic speakers today. We've got uh, Dr. Vanya Garage, Dr. Kate Mesh, and Dr. John Dudley. Uh, and I will go ahead and pass it to uh, Vanya to explain uh, what we're talking about here today, because it's it's really awesome. Okay, so um, thanks, Dylan, for inviting us, first of all. Um, should I share my screen now and then talk yeah. as we go right ahead? And the sharing is disabled. Somebody needs to enable that. Let me see if I can fix that here. Here, Vanya made you a co-host, so see if that uh, works for you. It works now. So can you all see the screen, the, the slide? Okay, so uh, thanks again for having us. And uh, what we are going to talk about today is our uh, research project, which we call Inclusive Immersion. And then the longer title is Inclusive Design of Immersive Content. So that's the kind of a key topic of the talk. And then towards the end, we're also going to announce our new project, which we are starting in January. Um, and the team presenting, it's me. I'm, I'm currently working as director of research, and uh, that's a very British title, reader in design um, at Brunel Design School, which is based at Brunel University in London. And then we have Kate from Open Inclusion. Do you want to say something now? Or, uh... Sure, I'm happy to. I'm Kate. I work for a research consultancy called Open Inclusion. For those of you who can hear my accent, it gives me away. I'm an American, but I moved to London. Um, I used to be an academic like uh, Vanya and John, and I am now a recovering academic, which means I could lapse at any time. But what I do is work on um, inclusive design research that makes sure that the experiences of people who, who do have lived experience of access needs makes it to the people who are designing products and services. And then we have John from Department of Engineering at Cambridge. So hi, John. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. I guess I'll talk more later. But yeah, my name is yeah. John. Nice to meet you. And I'm the Associate Teaching Professor at University of Cambridge. But when for the majority of this project, I was a research associate. And uh, my focus is on the design of uh, interactive systems for virtual and augmented and real reality. Thank you, John. So let me last one. Okay, so the, uh, I'll just quickly kind of say a few words about the project. We call it inclusive immersion. And uh, it's basically a research and development project which is funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which is one of the several funding, research funding agencies based in the UK, if, uh, by the UK government. Uh, this is funded under what is called the digital economy theme. Uh, the project started long time ago now, it was in 2019, and it's a four year project, so it will go on until mid next year. Uh, the overall value is about 700k in pounds. And we have a range of partners in this. Um, Brunel Design School, then Engineering Design Center at Cambridge, Open Inclusion, who are our industrial partner, and then uh, Royal National Institute of Blind People, which also goes by RNIB, and three smaller companies called Games London to Play For and Verti Health. Um, Brunel Design School, a, a bit about uh, our background. We are traditionally kind of focused on product design, but over the last, say, five to 10 years, we now started looking into uh, a lot of kind of teaching and research work related to digital design. And through this, we became also interested in immersive technologies about five, six years ago. Um, we kind of started this project because at some point in the UK, I think it was 2017, the government 
uh, so kind of announced that they are looking at immersive technologies as one of the priority areas for, for investment into research. And at, you know, we kind of realized that there was no um, formal project looking into inclusive design and accessibility of immersive environments at the time. So that's how it all started. Uh, within the school, I lead the group called Brunel Digital Design Lab, which uh, as the high level kind of uh, mission, we, we specialized in uh, design-led technology innovation for digital and digital physical systems, product services, and experiences. And then within this, we now kind of look into two things, two, two areas. One is the inclusive design of immersive environments, and the other one is the use of immersive technologies in heritage and cultural sector. So we did some other projects with, for example, the National Gallery here, where we worked on developing some games for children, which can be played on site in the gallery. And then over to Kate to talk about open inclusion. Sure, I think I already gave my introduction before my slide showed up, but Open Inclusion is the commercial partner for this project, which means that we were responsible for co-designing the uh, protocol or the guide for the usability test that we'll be talking about today. We were also responsible for recruitment for the study, and I'm quite lucky that this first talk that we get to give at XR Access is about methods, so I get to dig into the part that we were able to contribute. And I think that's my introduction, Vanya. Thanks, Kate. And then, um, yeah, there is some um, advertising here as well, which you may <laughs> want to go to. <laughs> um, and then, John, a few words about yeah, so, design center. Maybe, uh, maybe the tradition of inclu inclusive design there with the inclusive design toolkit. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm here to represent the University of Cambridge and the Engineering Design Center. If you just switch the, the next slide, Vanya. The uh, Engineering Design Centre at Cambridge here conducts uh, both fundamental and applied research into improving the design process. Um, there are actually 10 subgroups within the EDC, ranging from aeronautical design to health systems design, but most relevant to this project are the research groups which focus on inclusive design and intelligent interactive systems. So uh, what Vanya just mentioned was some previous work coming out of the inclusive design research group around uh, producing an exclusion calculator and in various other initiatives around improving inclusion through design. Thank you. So as a kind of a quick overview of what we did so far on the project, um, we were of course delayed at the beginning because of COVID uh, and we had to focus our work on trying to do things online. So we managed to complete a questionnaire which involved 101 exactly users with access needs across the spectrum in which we were looking into trying to understand quite high level um, basically you know details in terms of uh, you know what ba barriers they experience when trying to use uh, XR and uh, we were also talking uh, asking about what solutions they may want to see um, this included about 75% of these people were actually users of XR and 25 were looking into things from a sort of future use perspective. We then did a series of focus groups, which there were six focus groups with a total number of 30 um, people across again, the disability spectrum, where we started unpacking those uh, issues which were uh, basically established through the questionnaire in a little bit more detail. We also spoke to about, I think it was 22 uh, designers and developers to try to understand what would it make it easier for them to uh, design more inclusive um, XR environments. And then um, the key focus of the talk today is our latest study, which was just completed and where we did uh, a detailed kind of examination of uh, usability of seven different VR and uh, AR experiences, which involved 41 uh, user. Um, this study kind of adopted an inclusive design approach. And uh, again, we involved users across the disability spectrum. 
the main aim of the study was to develop a detailed specification of the use ba uh, barriers in, in VR and AR and try to kind of develop a catalog of the user requirements. Uh, as a bit of a disclaimer, today we are going to uh, present just the preliminary results. We are still doing um, analysis of qu qualitative data. The study took about eight months. Uh, we started probably in March and just been completed recently. Um, what we are also interested to do based on the data is to structure some kind of a human performance model which would link different types of disability and access needs with the use barriers and potential solutions to improve the, the access. So that would be an introduction to maybe some kind of a design guide as well, which may follow later on. And uh, I'm now going, I'm showing a diagram of our kind of user journey through the study, which also uh, shows how we kind of consider different types of in environment. So we are looking into initially at the physical interface and trying to understand what elements of um, the headset and, and control controllers may be an issue and, and how. And then we're moving to the digital interface as it relates to uh, the operating system of the device. And then finally, we're looking into first into digital interfaces of different apps and then the content of the app itself. So um, we are using um, Oculus devices uh, and basically, you know, looking into the, the standard kind of interface which comes with Oculus. And then as in, in preparing the study, as Kate said, uh, we did quite a bit of work in trying to understand how we should uh, structure our study sample. So this is, I'm now showing you what we call a user matrix, in which we uh, basically try to organize uh, different access needs according to different categories with the key ones being uh, perception, cognition, uh, communication, and mobility. And then within those, we also have um, several kind of subcategories. So with perception, we were looking into uh, access needs related to sight, hearing, and touch. Within cognition, there is the whole kind of set of different needs, um, include, for, for example, uh, you know, things to do with concentration and attention uh, span, difficulty understanding information and so on. Um, communication was mainly focusing on voice, but looking into non-vocal communication, phonation and so on. And then for mobility, we looked into the overall kind of physical mobility through space. Uh, the idea was to kind of try to understand the access needs as they relate in particular to, to, uh, to kind of using um, VR and AR devices. So we, we looked into physical mobility through space, the use of arms, use of hands, and then movement of head. Um, what we're also trying to do now is, they, is running another kind of uh, set of um, user sessions with people who do, do not have any declared access needs. So we are, we are going to use this as a control group. And finally, we are hoping to run a study of 10 people who are um, over the age of 65, but again, without any uh, declared access needs. And I think this is where I now uh, pass uh, to Kate. And she's going to talk a bit more about the actual methodology and how did we go about conducting the study. Thanks very much, Vanya. Um, I think that many of our audience members will be familiar with the joke, what does an 800 pound gorilla do? And the answer is it does anything it wants. Uh, the joke is usually about organizations that are so massive that they can get away with doing anything they want. But in this case, we're making a reference to the joke to point out that once your usability test becomes enormous, it can start to have its way with you. 
my part of today's talk is to describe the methods that we used to make sure that the 800 pound usability test actually worked for our research teams and for our participants. I'm ready for the next slide. So the first thing I want us to do is talk about how we defined pan disability for the study. So Vanya just put up a matrix of user needs. And I'm wondering if any of you have already taken a look at some very neatly organized cells in a grid and thought, huh, that isn't very likely to map well onto an actual human being. Uh, we couldn't agree with you more. Uh, next slide. For the purposes of our research design, we needed to recruit people who had a wide variety of access needs. So we created the matrix of needs to make sure that we had full coverage of, a, of the spectrum of needs that were of interest for working with VR and AR. But we also had to recognize that individuals have access needs well beyond one, and that we're very unlikely to find a person who categorizes neatly into any one of our boxes. What we chose to do for this study was to designate one access need as primary for every study participant. And to be clear, primary meant this access need will certainly come into play during our testing at some point, and it is something we want to explore. But then we also logged all of the other access needs that our participants had, and we kept detailed records so that we would be able to later say something like, hmm, we see a point of friction in this usability test, and it's probably related to the participants' colorblindness. Even though we wrote down that their primary access need was mobility, it seems really obvious from the notes that we took about um, color cues that this is not related to the primary access need in our matrix. I'm ready for the next slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. once, we, once we had our recruitment strategy in place, we could guarantee that a set of users with a broad range of access needs were going to be working with us on site. And we needed to create a procedure that would ensure that our testing conditions were right for all of those participants. I'm ready for the next slide. I want to tell this group, and by the way, we are we know that we are speaking to a group of peers that very little about testing in um, the environments where we are going to describe would be unfamiliar to you. So what's potentially different about this test is just the breadth of users that we brought in. But we definitely needed a procedure that um, would ensure that everybody we did bring in would feel comfortable working with us. Once we'd gotten into the swing of things, here's what we had in place. For planning, we sent emails to our participants with text descriptions and images of our testing location, which included the parking lot and our testing room and the accessible toilets nearby. We trusted that our participants would know better than we did what questions they wanted to answer for planning. And then we made ourselves available to answer questions several weeks in advance of any usability test. For traveling to us, we helped participants plan travel and we actually made funding available to reimburse taxis when this was the easiest way to reach us, which was true for a lot of the participants. For navigation, we had me, the facilitator on site, at least 30 minutes before every test and ready to meet the participant when and where they arrived and to help them to navigate from that point to our testing room. This was really important because we were on a massive university campus and the idea that our testing site would be easy to find turned out to be false. We set up the testing space itself to minimize friction for people coming in and out of immersive environments. And we did that in a couple of ways. We limited the number of researchers in the room and we worked with the participant to decide should we lower the lights or make any other changes to the room to make it a little bit less jarring to move from the immersive experience back into the physical world. We ensured that there were plenty of breaks scheduled into the testing period. And actually we asked participants to request as many unlimited breaks as they wanted beyond the ones we scheduled. And we made sure that during those breaks, we had food and still water and sparkling water available to help people recover energy and also to feel better if they experienced sim sickness. And finally, we made me the facilitator available to chat and decompress with participants after the sessions and to accompany participants to their transport options for the ride home. 
So that's how we managed to make a test as adaptable as possible for a lot of different people. And now I want to talk about the test itself, which will be the next slide. I think many of you, again, will be very familiar with the immersive experiences that we chose to test. And I'm only briefly going to review them here so you know which UI and interaction elements we were highlighting in order to have the test. So the next slide. As Vanya has mentioned, we were working with an Oculus Quest 2 VR set. We asked our uh, participants to start their testing session in the home area of the UI where a menu appears in the space in front of the user. And we asked players to make selections in the settings and app menus here. Next. Then we used Google's YouTube VR app to test voice commands with our participants only when they were willing to use their voices. So I do want to clarify, we asked all of our deaf participants if they would choose to use their voice for this activity at home. They said no, we respected that choice. So we have some data gaps here that are at the choice of the participants. Next. Then we showed the 360 degree video documentary called As It Is by 360 Labs. This experience had actually very few elements, but it did allow viewers to experience a river rafting trip inside an immersive environment. Uh, there's a small set of video controls and we did ask participants to use them. What I have on screen is one participant's view from the river rafting experience. Uh, next. We then worked with the job simulator game by Alchemy Labs, where players use their virtual hands to pick up and manipulate common objects. We chose this game uh, because we wanted to test a wide variety of interactive elements, and there are many ways of interacting with objects inside here. Um, you can see in this image of players reaching towards a crumpet that they have placed on the hob. By the way, I did not have to explain crumpet or hob one time in the UK. I was very pleased about that since I would never have understood what this meant if I were playing this game in the US. Um, feedback in this environment appears in the style of a robot narrator. And in this example, what we have is a caption from the robot that says, to cook flat items, humans used devices called toaster. This is just an example of the types of interactions that the robot would have with participants in this experience. Next. We worked with the Polyarch game Moss, which features a mouse called Quill. And we chose this game because it has a very different set of UI elements, and it does require the player to move a mouse, but also interact with all the objects around her. Here, our player is pulling a stone forward to create a bridge that Quill the mouse can walk over. Although in this image, she, she's sitting under the bridge. Next. The last VR experience that we tested was the Reality Labs game called Elixir. And we chose this game in order to test hand recognition features of the Oculus Quest in a fun environment. This is a game where players do not use hand controllers and instead they use their own hands to interact with virtual objects. And here we can see a player reaching one hand out to touch a stone and a virtual version of their hand appears over the stone. Next. Our two AR experiences were, were very straightforward. The, the first was the Amazon shopping app. We asked participants to use the view in my room feature to view a virtual piece of furniture inside the testing room. And here's the participants view as they're placing a purple chair inside of the room and they'll start to manipulate the chair and move it against other objects in the room to see the suitability of the chair's size. Next. The second VR experience was Van Gogh's room, which is an app that asks the user to scan inside their own room until a sketched doorway to Van Gogh's room appears in the space in front of them. And then the user can either physically move forward to see the updating image on the screen showing them passing through the doorway and moving inside the room, uh, or they can use gestures on the screen to essentially grab the room and pull it up around them so they've brought the room to them. Those are the full set of experiences that we tested with participants. Now, we anticipated that there would be many friction points in the testing where design was mismatched to users' needs, and we did not want to prevent those friction points, but we did want them to be manageable in the testing context. And this image, by the way, underscores my point by showing a user who's sitting in a wheelchair reaching up to a pantry door in the job simulator, but the door is inaccessibly high. 
Let's go to the next slide. So here's what we did to make it possible to observe friction points in a way that we could actually manage as a team. Uh, first, we gave ourselves a three hour time window to test the experiences that I just reviewed with you, which meant that we could have three mandatory breaks and even more breaks as needed or requested by a participant. Um, it also meant that we could uh, engage in problem solving, sometimes at length, uh, when we encountered friction and experience. I actually see Lucas is saying he has a question and wants to know if he should save it for later. Oh, what the heck, Lucas, I wanna hear your question. Maybe you could type it into the chat. Yeah, were these activities chosen using any previous research knowledge or was it more using what was available? That's a really good question. Vanya had done previous research um, focus groups that had yeah, asked about Sorry, go ahead, Vanya. Yeah, and, uh, so we were trying to uh, <clears throat> obviously use what was available, but not in a random way. Uh, the idea was to try to somehow expose people to uh, different experiences, which then require the use of different kind of faculties uh, across that spectrum uh, and across the user matrix. So um, we want, you know, so. We, I'm not sure whether we covered everything 100%. And then the, the other point was to try to make them progressively slightly more difficult from one to another to see uh, how that kind of affects performance as well. So yeah, that's we, did, a... we, we did think quite a bit about which experiences to include. So they relate to the matrix and the you know, kind of difficulty and, and how it progresses through, through, through the whole kind of set of experiences. And then, yeah, of course, really... we want to mix VR and AR. Nice. It's a really Sorry. good point because, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Sonia. It's a really good point because this matrix of user needs meant that if we were asking participants to come in who said, I have difficulty with um, vocal expression, then we needed to make sure, of course, that we were testing experiences where that would be relevant. So we did some fitting of the experiences to the full access need profile that we started with. But we also did choose a lot of things that were just out there. When it comes to trying to make this test work really well and manage the around friction points that we did want to capture, there's um, something else that we were able to do with this three hour time window, which is that we could sometimes engage in problem solving at length. So if someone really wanted to see if there was a way to make an experience work for them, we really had the time flexibility in those three hours to do that. We also assigned a separate note taker, which might seem like a trivial point, but it freed me as the facilitator to keep my visual attention on the participants. And it also allowed me to fully engage during problem solving. So if a person said, grab this controller, I want you to do this, I had the flexibility and freedom to do that. Next. We also invited participants themselves to think ahead to friction points with us and to help us make the test as suitable as possible for them. So they could explore the full set of experiences. The photos here are showing one of our participants who's a, a person of small stature. Uh, I should mention that anybody whose image is here has given permission to, for this image to be shown in today's talk. Uh, about two weeks before the test, we had a phone call with this participant to talk about possible friction in the testing experience. And we decided together that it would be wise to have a way for him to engage without wearing a heavy headset because it could put too much pressure on his head and neck. So we designed a rig where we could mount the headset on a tripod and make it possible to hold the headset and walk up to it. And we also made time within the testing session for the participant to wear the headset and just test the possibility that it might be feasible to wear it. Now, as it happens, this participant is also deaf and he uses BSL interpreters. Um, and coincidentally, he and I both sign American Sign Language. So in the image, you can see that he and I are signing. And for anybody who's wondering, he does have pass-through enabled on the headset. So he's looking through the camera of the headset and can see me. And in the background behind me, we also have a set of BSL interpreters who are on site to make communication more fluid since ASL is not my native language and it is not the participant's native language. Now, I've talked a lot about friction in the past few minutes. And, and I want you to take a look at our coding system so you can see how we moved from frictions to solutions inside the coding itself. Um, all of our codes talk about whether and how an experience works for the participant just as it is out of the box. 
and then whether the participant can make the experience work for them with adaptations or assistance. So we defined the word adaptations to um, describe behavior changes that the participant themselves used to make the VR work better for them. So a nice example would be if a participant said, I actually want to put one hand controller down and I want to operate one hand controller with both of my hands. We would treat that as an adaptation that the participant chose. We defined assistance as any place where I, as the facilitator, stepped in, uh, typically to mimic the presence of a design feature just, just wasn't there. So if we needed, um, as an example, a screen reader for blind users, then um, I might mimic the presence of a screen reader uh, and we would call that ad hoc imitation an assistance. So our scoring system was designed to highlight solutions that were emerging in our, se our sessions um, really in a qualitative way to talk about what kinds of solutions participants were coming up with and what might work well. And then of course the numerical scores helped us to quantify just how much the design worked out of the box versus how much these ad adaptations and types of assistance were really required. Um, I see a couple more questions and I want to quickly address the ones that I can and then I'm gonna hand it off to John so he can talk about just what the scoring system got us in terms of earlier results. Um, did we do any testing on the hardware? The answer is we didn't have as much opportunity to make adaptations to the hardware, but absolutely we had a section of the testing where we talked about, is it possible to hold it, manipulate it? What does and doesn't work? What are participants choosing to do? Same thing for the headset. Is it possible to adjust the headset? Does it require assistance or adaptations? Um, the platform hardware we used for the study was the Oculus Quest 2. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to John. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay, so yes, I'm gonna be talking about some of the preliminary results. As, as Svenja mentioned, these are sort of hot off the press, so forgive any gaps in the data or some um, you know, missing points that here and there. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, Svenja. So just as a reminder, um, this is the brief categorization of uh, primary access needs that we applied. The purpose being just to give us some resolution to the uh, well, allocation of participants to the study, but also some resolution to the analysis. But we totally recognize that this is imperfect as, uh, as Kate elaborated, elaborated on earlier. Um, I guess just one way to think of it is, is the ways in which the hardware or software may erect different different barriers to inclusion. And that's that's what we wanted to give some resolution to. Okay. Next slide, please. Yep. Okay, so this is the first result slide. Um, I realize this is maybe a bit to take in, but the actual, the specific detail shown in the table is not super important. It's more about a uh, general impression from the coloration. Um, you'll see on the top right here is the, the scoring uh, rubric or the, the the, the scoring system that uh, Kate mentioned, um, where a three uh, or that dark green color is a is the fact that the participant could start and complete a task without any need for assistance or some custom adaptations. Um, and the table in the middle here shows, uh, and this relates to one of the questions in the chat, um, a focus initially on the hardware in terms of the main task of just being able to put on and take off the headset, make some minor adjustments, and uh, being able to hold the controllers and use the buttons. And so within the main task, um, which didn't really, wasn't super covered in the previous um, few slides, within the main task, we had a set of subtasks uh, where we scored the whether participants were able to complete those subtasks without uh, any assistance or adaptations. And so a score of three means that they could complete a subtask without any assistance. And if we treat all subtasks within the main task, say, for example, the four subtasks that relate to the main subtask of putting on and taking off the headset and making adjustments, which includes literally putting on the headset, uh, adjusting the straps, taking the headset off and adjusting the, the, uh, the lenses, then if we, if we assume that uh, a score of less than three on any of these subtasks indicates that the participant cannot complete the main task without some assistance, then we can use this and that it, realize that's a simple, simplifying assumption to compute 
the percentage of participants who could not complete the main task without assistance. So to, to summarize, this gives us a figure of 26.8% uh, of the participants who required at least some bespoke adaptations or assistance to put on the headset, take it off and, it, uh, and perform some adjustments. And 24% and, uh, of participants who required at least some bespoke assistance or adaptations to hold and use the controllers. And this is just talking about the hardware, uh, independent of the underlying experience that they were uh, involved engaged in. Um, next slide, please. Um, I will elaborate on the bespoke adaptations later. Um, thank you for the question. I'll try and guess those. Okay, so uh, on this slide, we're now talking about the uh, the VR experiences that Kate mentioned. Uh, not included here is the VR experience um, using YouTube with voice commands. I'm just talking about uh, so VR one, two, three, four, five here. VR one is uh, just interacting with the operating system menus. Two is enjoying the uh, passive 360 degree video. That was the uh, Grand Canyon experience. Three was playing Moss. Four was uh, playing the job in the job simulator. And five was Elixir, which is the, the hand gesture recognized uh, based uh, game. And uh, as Vanya mentioned in the selection of the, these experiences, they become progressively more uh, embodied and interactive as you go from one to five. And this is what also appears in the, uh, the, the scoring. So we see uh, using the same uh, assumptions that I mentioned earlier, that if there's a, a score of less than three on any of the subtasks within the main task for that particular experience, if we use that as a, a rough measure of the percentage of participants who uh, could not complete their main task, then across the bottom there, you see, uh, say in VR experience one, 30% of participants could not complete the main task without some form of assistance which might just simply be uh, you know, more involved descriptions or like Kate mentioned, um, some sort of uh, sign language interpretation or some uh, physical assistance with uh, holding the controllers or, or moving the participant in space in a controlled manner. Uh, and then you can see uh, this percentage rising towards VR3, 4 and 5 to in excess of 75%. So I guess the general takeaway here is that more interactive and more embodied experience correlate with more uh, need for assistance, which is an intuitive result I, you would expect. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here is the same uh, form of uh, results for the AR experiences. So uh, again, these were both uh, mobile based, sorry, <laughs> lights in my room turn off automatically. Uh, these are both augmented uh, mobile based augmented reality experiences. Uh, and the first is slightly less uh, interactive and embodied than the second, where the second involved you sort of performing some gestures on the touch screen and, and moving into a, a, uh, a virtual sort of room. Um, and again, we see the same kind of general results here that uh, as as the experience becomes more interactive, the, then it, it presents more difficulty for participants, as again, you would expect. Um, next slide, please, Vanya. Yeah, thank you. Um, Okay, so again, I realize this table is, is a bit overwhelming initially. I'll try and do my best to interpret it. Uh, the top table here is a summary of what we refer to as the exclusion rates across the different main tasks. And so the number shown within the uh, individual box is the, the percentage of participants who could not complete the main task without some form of assistance. So as I mentioned, this might be relatively simple assistance, like uh, just explaining exactly what they need to do in that particular situation up to something much more involved, like uh, providing some sort of scene description or uh, interpretation. Uh, Kate can maybe elaborate on this more in a moment. Um, and 
an attempt to at least do some categorization across the different forms of access need, but recognizing that this is just primary access need and it's not a perfect categorization. So just to reiterate, um, one thing that this table highlights is that, uh, and I already mentioned this in the previous slides, that as the experience becomes more interactive, we see uh, increase in exclusion rates. So uh, up, up to 100% for some forms of uh, access needs. Um, on the table below uh, here, we show the percentage of participants who could not complete the task, even with some bespoke adaptation. So um, if, if, uh, if you recall the scoring system, essentially this means the percentage of participants who, uh, who were scored less than two on at least one of the subtasks within the main task. Uh, I think this tells a more uh, promising picture. Uh, you see a lot more green in the bottom plot. And uh, what that suggests is that even with uh, relatively minor adaptations or assistance, um, the, the experiences can be, can, can be made significantly less exclusionary. And so I guess that's the second key takeaway from these preliminary results that um, adaptations and or simplest assistance can be very, uh, useful um, and and greatly expand the inclusion of these technologies. A second there. Can I jump in, John, just to yeah. contextualize this in another way? So one thing that we talked with participants about is that the scoring is always for the design of the um, hardware and software itself. It's not a score for the participant. So this is why the, the caption here says exclusion rates. What we're saying is um, what we're what we're saying is that some people have been excluded through design choices. And when we say that bespoke adaptation or assistance was helpful, it's not that we're suggesting that the future of XR is that people should have to adapt their own behaviors or that they should always look for assistance. What we're saying is that these are beautiful opportunities for us to look at the design and see what did the adaptation or assistance get us to? What was the solution that we came to? And why can't that be encoded uh, right into the original design? Yeah, th thanks, Kate. I, yes, that's an important point. What, what I mean here really is that uh, by the second takeaway is that if we can uh, operationalize these adaptations and assistance and actually embed them into the out of the box experience, uh, then that's a promising picture going forward. And so um, I think I'll just try to kind of con conclude the lecture then, or the talk. Um, the overall aim which uh, for, for, for the project is to use the data and the, the research which we do to see whether we can develop some tools to improve the accessibility of XR. Uh, so it's not just uh, pure research, it has a sort of more utilitarian purpose as well. Um, and we are, as we continue working on the current project, we are now going, as I said before, we are going to be starting on a new one, which is called Towards an Equitable Social VR. And as the title suggests, the new project is going to be looking into the social kind of immersive experiences, VR and AR if possible. Um, so if you probably notice that all the experiences which we kind of uh, assessed in, in the current project are quite solitary, individual kind of uh, interaction experiences. But we are now uh, in the new project, we are very much interested to see uh, what happens in social spaces. Uh, that's also funded by the same funding agency. So we are quite happy, lucky to, to have their support. And overall, it's going to take, you know, be, be, they're covering uh, our work for a number of years. Um, we now have some new partners as well. One of them is uh, called Digital Catapult, and they're an, another kind of government agency here in the UK, which is uh, trying to, you know, they're, they're looking to facilitating um, commercial kind of activities from research projects. So uh, looking at, you know, by, by doing our research, we are also interested to see whether we can, um, you know, somehow try to convert this into uh, some kind of marketable or, a, you know, 
solutions which may become available in the market. And then we also have Meta as a partner on the new project. Um, the project is slightly, slightly larger uh, and it will go on until the end of 25, possibly even longer than that. And as I said before, we're going to be focusing on social VR and the metaverse. Uh, we are probably going to use Horizon Worlds as a testing ground. And the idea here is going to be to, is to kind of uh, not really bring people into the lab, but uh, supply headsets to them and then meet them in a social VR space and then conduct those experiments within the VR environment by remote, uh, which kind of follows the whole kind of idea of social VR. Uh, that's again probably enough to talk about, uh, you know, about this diagram for the next ten minutes. I'm just going to quickly kind of uh, <laughs> explain what what's here. So this is like the domains, different domains of of what we're interested in. So we're looking into the whole kind of experience uh, domain, which includes content environments and then uh, user interfaces and interactions. Uh, with social VR, there is the complexity in that users become also developers or can become developers. So that's going to be the secondary layer of our investigation. And um, we are going to obviously build on what we have done so far and try to probably apply the same user matrix with some modifications in the new research. But uh, overall, I think the key focus is going to be on uh, you know, the, the environmental aspects, which can be changed by design, but, and we are also interested in human behavior in social VR and see how that affects inclusion. Um, so functional and psychosocial aspects of inclusion. And then why do all this? Uh, this is our second line of inquiry. We believe that the immersive rea reality uh, has a strong potential to contribute to the quality of life overall. And uh, you know, th that can be explained by this concept of virtual mobility. Uh, it can extend to social life, education, employment, entertainment, and so on. So accessibility is just one step towards achieving that. And whoever is, if, if there is anyone interested to read a bit more about this, we recently published a short article on how we kind of see these things on uh, the platform called The Conversation, which was also then republished by a number of other uh, media, but uh, that's something to uh, maybe look up after the, the, the talk. And that's, I think, where we finish. We now have some time for, to take some questions. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Vanya. Uh, on case fantastic uh, fantastic presentation here um I, we see a couple of questions in the chat uh, we have one from tracy lawson on uh, examples of bespoke adaptations uh, they say i find i have to adjust the headset a lot with most users and user testing no matter who the testers are shall i take that one vanya does that work yeah that's related to the uh, research right so yeah yeah, yeah. So Tracy, I agree completely. I think the vast majority of people want help adjusting the headset. The way that I would score this to show whether or not the design was really exclusionary is if a participant, if I held the hand controllers and said, can you put on the headset, please? And the participant took as much time as they needed to put the headset on and said, I cannot make it stay on my head. Um, can you help? Then I would mark that there was something about the headset that the design really required assistance or adaptation. Um, if a participant popped on their headset and then said, ah, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't think it's quite right, and I eventually stepped in and said, do you know that you can adjust this piece, then we didn't rate it in the same way. We would say that didn't require an adaptation. Um, that was more that the headset was fiddly and a person uh, was impatient. But if they could adjust it one time, then we knew that it was possible to do. I hope that helps. Awesome. And I see. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there is a few other questions. I mean, did you want to read them out? Or yeah. I was just going to say, it looks like we have a couple of questions from uh, Maggie to go here. Uh, apologies if the pronunciation is wildly incorrect. Uh, what are some hardware changes you would suggest based on the results of the usability testing? 
And how does one get to work on research projects like this? I worked on one for over a year for a well-known social media client. I would love to do more work like this. And that is Maggie Tago. Apologies. So how do you get to work on a project like this? It's like any other job, really. You have to apply <laughs> and uh, we, you know, we, we will soon be advertising for uh, two posts on a new project on, on the so, uh, um, towards the equitable social social VR project. So that may be an opportunity. Uh, I think these jobs are advertised on jobs.ac.uk. Uh, and we are always looking for, you know, candidates who are really kind of passionate about um, inclusive design in the context of immersive technologies. Um, there is also, I mean, we can also work informally, so please get in touch and we can discuss this uh, further. There is now a few more messages. Let me see. I need to open them. Um, so there are some other jobs being posted here now. I can see that. Uh, Anya, I see uh, one I, that might be useful. I don't know if you want to plug for another talk that we have upcoming, but some people are asking, based on all these findings, what do we think ought to be changed specifically? What are the design recommendations? Right. So that that's something which uh, we will we may we, we will come back to in a few months' time, I guess, and we will then talk more about the findings once we are ready. Um, I think there is not, you know, what, what, what the way how we see it is, uh, we actually call this, um, we, we called it in the bid, hyper-personalization, right? So uh, the adaptations which are simulated in the study should hopefully be somehow automated in practice. And then, uh, you know, each individual, different users will have the ability to kind of, uh, you know, have those adaptations suited to their own needs. But uh, the answer to that, I don't think we can really answer the question uh, just so, you know, in a simple way, right? There is a lot of different things which would have to be done. So we are now trying to make uh, some, you know, system out of all this. Uh, we are working with a massive uh, spreadsheet with lots of data. And we are going to try to categorize this in, uh, like, first of all, friction points based on those key categories and then you know try to kind of understand what the adaptations or solutions may be needed and then think of how do we what one of the key challenges is how do you kind of come up with something which works technologically and can be you know implemented in in, in a number of different environments so yeah uh, may i add you... something there vanya yeah yeah sure sure mm -hmm. Thanks. I think that my colleague Tom at Open Inclusion would be very excited to tell you that we will have a design focused talk that will come up in the spring. Um, so we, we rather artificially carved this into the methods and how we made this 800 pound study workable for us. And then the design pieces of it's not perfect. The recommendations aren't finished yet, but here's what we think would really work for design. <clears throat> and I, unfortunately, I don't have a date uh, nailed down for that yet, but I know we're working with Dylan to have that at XR Access. I think the the estimate would be sometimes in February or March, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, uh, we'll get back to you on this. We're very excited to see the part two of this uh, this chat as soon as all this delicious data has been digested a bit. And, awesome. Any other questions? I see one last question coming in here uh, from Miranda McCarthy. Have you explored the idea of using co-pilots for users with complex needs and embracing interdependence rather than independence? Uh, yeah, I mean, not, not, we probably didn't use this term, but we did discuss uh, the idea of uh, assistance, um, which would be, again, provided in most cases in some kind of automated way, but are you do you, are you referring to human assistance? Like remote human assistance? Is that yes. what, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we didn't really talk about this uh, in particular. I think uh, we are quite, uh, so far we have been talking mainly about automating um, and use, you know, Kind of providing some assistance in an automated fashion. Right? Okay, but thanks. I think that the, I think there is definitely an option opportunity for this in social VR, where there are you know multiple users sharing experiences. 
yeah, that would be fascinating, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be very curious to see a, a system like uh, Ira or Be My Eyes implemented across VR as well, where we can kind of call in remote social. So many, so many ways that we can go with this type of thing. But I think for today, we are just about out of time. Um, I want to, again, uh, thank our speakers here for a, an amazing presentation. This is an incredible piece of research. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the follow-up. Um, we will be posting this talk on our XR Access YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for, for coming. And uh, thank you, and have a great one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much to your team.